Luke chapter 11. We are working our way through Luke and we've gotten to some of Jesus's teaching and some of his uh, instructions. We started chapter 11 with his instruction on prayer and then we saw his instruction when someone was rescued from demon possession and how some people's response was incorrect an incorrect view of Jesus and who he was and now as we come to verse 37 uh, you could say we are still looking at improper understandings of who God is uh, but what we will see is that some people are religious without being saved and that is truly what we need to be worried about here today it would be easy to get all caught up in doing the little things instead of serving God so we'll begin reading in Luke chapter 11 verse 37 and as he spake a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him and he went in and sat down to meet and when the Pharisee saw it he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner and the Lord said unto him now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness ye fools did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye have done, and not to leave the other undone. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogue and greetings in the markets. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as the graves which appear not, and as men that, sorry, and as the men that walk over them are not aware of them. This morning we're seeing Jesus talking to the Pharisees, particularly a Pharisee who invited him over for dinner. Now, just to start out. When someone invites you over for dinner, don't look to pick a fight with them. <laughs> Jesus here wasn't looking to pick a fight with the Pharisees. He came to their house just as he had come to Nicodemus's house, just as he had come to many people's house along the way. Remember, even just a chapter or so back, he went to Mary and Martha's house. He was uh, accustomed to coming to people's house staying with them, eating a meal with them, and continuing to explain his teachings. But here this Pharisee brought him in, and the Pharisee was disturbed. Notice Jesus didn't do anything strange. He came when he was asked to dine, and in verse 37, he went in and sat down to meet. He didn't do anything strange or completely out of the ordinary but the Pharisee marveled that he had not first washed before dinner now kids you need to wash your hands before you eat I'm sure your parents tell you this and it's good because it keeps you healthy uh, this is not what has happened here Jesus was not coming in with dirt under his fingernails and you know having petted the animals or you know handled greasy um, you know motor oil or something and now he's sitting down to the table no Jesus had clean hands he hadn't done the ceremonial clean things that the Pharisees had added to what the Bible required you see the Old Testament required that when people did certain things they had to wash first or they had to wash after but the Pharisees in order to go beyond the law had added other things such that they would go through a whole ritual of washing they would pour water over this hand 
Then they would pour water over that hand. Then they would wash in a basin. And then they would sit down and then they would still wipe their hands with a cloth. It was overdone. It wasn't about cleanliness. It was about signaling to everyone that we are clean. It wasn't about doing what God had required. It was about going beyond what God had required. Jesus puts this to the point or to the test uh, in that he said in verse um, 39, ye wash the outside of the cup and the platter, but the inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. And he's not talking about their cups and platters. He wasn't looking at their food and saying, yeah, but your food is dirty. No, he was comparing hands to cups and he was saying, look, you're washing the outside of your hands, but on the inside, you're dirty. He's saying that you've washed the outside of the platter, but you haven't even considered about the important part of the platter. You know, when you have a plate, if the top part is clean, then when you put the food on it, it's not going to get contaminated. But here, the Pharisees were concerned that there were no spots on the outside or on the bottom of the plate, and yet were not considering the more important aspects of the law. What were some of the aspects of the law that they were missing? Well, we see in verse 40, one area that this particular Pharisee was failing in, and that most failed in, was that they failed to give to those who were in need. It says in verse 40, Ye fools, did not he that make that which is without also make that which is within? Verse 41, But rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. You see, they were careful to obey the law. They would do the things they thought they were required to do, and yet they failed to do what Jesus, uh, what God had actually told them to do. Uh, later we'll see that they did some things to excess and left off other parts. But here at this first part, they did not consider that it is God who makes us clean and not we ourselves. And they thought that their good works, their washing of their hands made them clean. But Jesus was saying, if you have not done the things that God wants in that giving of alms or these other things to help those around you, then you are not fulfilling the requirements of the law and you are not clean because it is God who declares you clean, not you who declare yourself clean. We need to be careful we do not become like the Pharisees in several ways. First, we need to be careful that we do not become judges of everyone around us. We do not need to be the washing of hands police. Again, kids, you have to wash your hands before you go and eat. <laughs> if you've been out in the farm or you've been running around in the dirt, you have to wash your hands. But we don't need to be so focused on that, policing that, which is what the Pharisees did, that they would keep an eye out. Did Jesus wash his hands exactly the way, the ceremonial way that we've been doing it, that we've added to the law? Has he done every step of the pouring on this hand, then the pouring of that hand, and then the washing in the basin? Is that, has he followed that procedure instead of looking, is this man have a heart after God's heart? Is this man giving to those who are in need? Is this man following the law completely? We need to be careful not to become judges with false measurements. We do need to watch and to judge, but we must not be judgmental or looking for insignificant things or things that we've made up ourselves that are not important. Instead, we need to make sure that the things God declares are important are the things that are top on our list. That verse 40 um, is very, very, very key to this whole discussion. 
God is the one who made everything. And God is the one who makes us either clean. Without him, we are unclean. And this is in the Old Testament use of this word. We're not talking about wiped without spot, but we're talking about ceremonially, ceremonially clean or pure before God. Not talking about dirt here. We're talking about a heart that is pure. God is the only one who can make your heart pure. Without God, mankind cannot do anything on the outside that will purify his heart. This was true in the Old Testament just as it was and is now. In Jesus' time, it was not the ceremonies you did that saved you. It was your reliance upon an almighty, all-powerful, and gracious God who had given you an opportunity to get your sins forgiven. That was what you needed. You needed God. Without him, you weren't clean. You weren't free. And so Jesus is pointing out the main thing the Pharisees were missing. They had religion but they did not have God. We come to church on Sunday morning and we all look around us and we see who's here. And I don't know if you do this, but sometimes I tick off in my mind a list of people that I haven't seen in a while and I wonder where they are. Sometimes I call them and let them know I've been praying for them or thinking of them. But in my mind, I'm ticking off in a list and it could become that same thing as the Pharisees. Coming on Sunday morning is a form of serving God. It is not the entirety. It is the small detail, not the most important part. The most important part is God coming into your heart and rescuing you from your sins. That's the most important part. So don't let us get the cart before the horse. Don't let us get the small details in front of the big important ones. And that's actually what Jesus hits next with the Pharisees in verse 42 through um, 40. Well, basically just 42 there. Um, he says, Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. You see, the Pharisees were very careful. The word tithe means a tenth. And the Jews would give a tenth of the increase to God. But the Pharisees would even go so far as if they found some parsley on the side of the road and they picked a bunch of it, they would bring one tenth of it and sometimes they would even count it out by the leaves and give a tenth of it to God and they would make sure they took it to the temple with them next time they went. That was not bad, but they were focused on that. Instead of being focused, as Jesus says here, on judgment and the love of God. They should have been focused on obtaining God's love and not counting the leaves of herbs and mint that they were using. Jesus says, these ought ye have to have done to love God and to love the judgment of God and not to leave the other undone. For the Jews, they were required to bring the tenth. But they weren't limited to it. They could have spent a lot less time counting the leaves and still managed to give God the tenth and to honor God and focus on loving God and getting his love and focus on the judgment of God. Those are the things they should have been aimed at, focused on. The big things. Once you have the big things down, you can get the small details right later. But if you don't get those big details right, you're going to be in trouble. You know, if you come every Sunday to Sunday school and to church and you memorize hundreds of verses and you do all the little things, you make sure you got every word perfect on your memory verses, which I have to admit was very annoying when I was a kid. 
uh, always being required. You have to get every word right. You have to put them in the right order. And you're like, oh, no, I put the the in the wrong place. <laughs> and that's important. But what's more important? If you did all of those things and you did not ask God to come into your heart, to wash away your sins, to grant you a place with him for eternity, you have done all of the small little things, but you missed the important ones. That's what this is about. Again, the Pharisees weren't doing things that were evil. They weren't even doing things that were wrong in this part of it. You know, tithing is what they should have been doing. But they were focused on the wrong things. So now Jesus has uh, condemned the Pharisees for their washing without being concerned with the inside of their hearts and the cleanliness of that. He's condemned the Pharisees for focusing on the little things and ignoring the bigger things. But now we see Jesus is going to condemn the Pharisees for their pride and for their hypocrisy. Verse 43, he says, Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. The uppermost seats were the uh, most popular seats, the most important, prestigious seats. Um, in Baptist churches, it's often the back row. <laughs> it's the most important. Everybody wants the seat in the back row. <laughs> uh, the Pharisees, they would have claimed those seats as a right. They would have loved those seats because they were entitled to them. Or maybe they would have picked the front seat so everyone could see them. I don't know. The, the point here is, though, that they picked the best seats in the house and they made sure they got them because they were worth it. They also wanted greetings in the markets. They wanted to be recognized. Um, this may not come clear in English, but greetings in the markets is to be approached and asked for help in the way that someone would come, come to a judge for a judgment. In the older parts of the Old Testament, you would have the chief people of the city sitting at the gates. And when someone came at the gates, they were not just coming through the entrance, they were approaching the people who were in charge of that city and they were getting help for their task, either for their business or for their um, whatever project they had on hand. Here, the Pharisees, they want the greetings in the markets. They want people to come to them and to ask them, now, how should I do this? How do I purchase my mint and my herbs? How do I tithe them? Give, give us some advice on what to buy, what stocks to own, and how to work in this world. Give us God's perspective on, and that is what the Pharisees loved to do. They loved to sit in the most privileged seats and to have the most uh, pride of place for people to come to them and ask for their opinion. They were full of pride. Notice here, Jesus doesn't give a positive part to this woe. He doesn't say, you should have done this and not to leave the other part undone. He didn't say, you, you've at least cleaned the outside of the plates. No, here he just says, you're full of pride. That's pretty scary. The Pharisees, they thought they were doing what was right before God. And Jesus is accusing them of pride. How does this apply to us? You might ask. Well, have you ever said, I go to church in a prideful manner? <laughs> have you ever said, I read my Bible every day or I'm a good Christian? Not trying to help someone else come to Christ, but rather to show off why you 
are above whatever concern they are uh, broaching with you. Maybe they're asking you, well, why don't you come to the pub with us and drink? And you say, oh, but I go to church or I read my Bible or I'm a Christian. And you use it as a place of pride instead of trying to prove to them that God is so much more important than drinking at the pub. You are full of pride that you, I don't drink. I go, I go to church. I have the important seat. People listen to me because I'm a Christian. It's easy to get prideful, even when we're doing the right thing. So this is truly a warning that we need to take to heart. Again, I, I'm not accusing us here of being the Pharisees, but I'm saying we could easily slip into this mode. We could easily fall to the same trap that trapped the Pharisees. It was a trap that Satan sets for each one of us. Oh, you're doing the right thing. Oh, well, you should be proud of that then. No, we need to be humble and remember where we would be if God was not the one cleaning us. Where would I be? Would I be on the streets? Would I be under the influence of drugs? Would I be full of all kinds of wickedness? Probably. Without God's help, there go I. That's what our heart's attitude needs to be. Not full of pride, but full of God's love. He's the one who loves us. Let's go now to verse 44. Uh, Jesus' accusation gets a little bit more broad, not just the Pharisees, which were a select group of very proud and very um, well-taught people in Israel. But now we come to verse 44. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. This opens the accusation much broader, not just the Pharisees who had most things right, but also to the scribes who they had the ability to read and write, which wasn't very common back then. And so they would read the Bible and explain it sometimes, but they weren't experts on the Bible. They just were readers of the Bible. And Jesus calls them hypocrites. Uh, this has been a continual accusation of Christianity since pretty much the beginning. We have been called hypocrites and sometimes rightly. We have, even you and I in our lifetimes, since we've been saved, sometimes said the one thing and done the other. Paul describes this great conflict within us when he says, those things that I would do, I do not. And those things that I would not do, those I do. Uh, sometimes the very instant we're saying, I'm not going to do that, we end up turning and doing it. Our hearts are very fickle. And each one of us could be in this place of being a hypocrite. But I want you to see where they are wrong or why Jesus calls them a hypocrite. His reasoning in this instance, he's going to call them hypocrites a lot more through the rest of this book. <laughs> but here, his reasoning is that they are as graves which appear not and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. You see, in those days, if you walked over a grave, it made you unclean, unfit to go to the temple. It made you unworthy to approach to God. And that was actually in the law. These Pharisees and scribes, they pretended to have all the answers and proclaimed God's word. And yet, when people walked the way they had declared, they were sinning over and over. This actually brings us back to that first part of this, where Jesus sat down. He had fulfilled what the law required, but not what the Pharisees expected. He hadn't done the little rules that they had added 
on top. He hadn't washed with his left hand, uh, washed his left hand first and then his right hand and then in a basin. He hadn't followed that ceremony. That part wasn't in the Old Testament. That was added by them. And so here the Pharisees have put out a rule. You must wash your hands in this manner at this time and for these purposes. But they were causing people to stumble and to sin. They were causing people to forget about the important things. Like a relationship with God that is right. Or love of God and judgment of God and obeying God. And instead were pointing people to count the leaves on the herbs they were using. And so they ended up making people sin without even being aware of it. And this is what Jesus is condemning here. I do not think that anyone in this room is declaring to people parts of the law that are not true. But we do need to be careful of many who claim the title of Christ who say they are Christians, and yet the way they preach for salvation is entirely wrong. And if someone follows the path that they have laid out, they are walking straight to the grave and straight to hell. Laying traps for people. That is, they walk over the graves and they're not aware. I don't know about today's graves because they get filled in with dirt, but in those days they were caves. They would hollow out a cave. And if you walked over a cave unawares, you might fall in. And so here is the danger. Someone who doesn't know the correct way to get to Jesus Christ to get to heaven, to have their sins forgiven, if we point them to anything else, whether it is by pointing to some little thing that we want them to do that is not based on salvation, like, for instance, as we've already mentioned, drinking alcohol. We say, you shouldn't drink alcohol because there's a verse against that. A little thing. It's important, but it's a little thing compared to a relationship with Jesus Christ and salvation of the soul. We must make sure that we do not distract people from their need of a savior by expecting them to follow rules. Instead, let us point them to one who can rescue them and make them whiter than snow on the inside. Uh, I want us to look at that verse again. It'd be a good one to memorize. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also you see jesus and god they made us and they know how to clean us up on the inside they know how to take those thoughts that are wrong and take them away they know all the hidden parts of our insides they know the nooks and crannies they know those things we thought we've hidden. They know that. God is not distracted. He knows exactly where that sin is hidden. And it is evil in his sight. But if we come to him, he will, because he is full of judgment and love, will wash that sin away. The Pharisees preached a judgmental God who had no love. And today, many people preach a loving God who has no judgment. Both of those things are wrong. Let us preach God who sees our sin and yet still sent his son, who sees our wickedness and still wants to save us. That is the God that we serve. He's a God of judgment and of love. This is not um, me making this up this is what Jesus has said about God the Pharisees didn't understand God 
Let us understand him that we do not become hypocrites. We could go on and and discuss the the lawyers, uh, those who debated the law, and um, because they then have a another whole section of woes, and we'll get into that next time. But I want you to look in verse 53 and see the reaction of the Pharisees. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. You see, Jesus didn't wash his hands the way they wanted. You know, maybe today you look at someone and their mask falls below their nose or whatever, and you, you judge them for it. You're like, oh, what are you doing? You know, not to wear your mask. <laughs> no, I'm not poking in, pointing anyone out today. <laughs> Everyone's looking around. Um, you know, you, you point out that one thing, but because of something as insignificant as that, the Pharisees had turned against Jesus and were looking for a way to trip him up to catch him in his own words, to try and accuse him. They were graves, which appear not. These Pharisees, they were so opposed to turning their hearts to God that they attacked the messenger. Again, at this time, they, uh, they may not have understood Jesus was God, and they haven't started that attack against him yet but they are still against him as a mouthpiece of God because of what he is saying and they didn't like it they didn't want someone to point out their pride they didn't want someone to point out their hypocrisies and they definitely didn't want anyone to realize they had hidden sins let us be open with one another and with God each one of us has sinned We've come short of the glory of God. There is no one who has lived perfect and sinless. Let us then come to the one who can rescue us from all of our sins. The one who will wash us within. Make us clean within. And let us fulfill the law, as Jesus said. He came to this earth to fulfill the law, not to break it. Let us fulfill the law of God and then have clean hands to lift up to him in praise. Let's close with a word of prayer.